Now, today we're discussing uh, the revival of Islam amongst Muslims, the revival. We're talking about the revival of Muslims. And the structure for what I'm going to talk about, just so you all know, is going to be to first understand what change means, what change is in of itself, and when it's needed. And we're going to talk about the nature of systems, the systems in which we live, the systems with which we develop our cultures and in which we develop our people. And we're going to discuss the timelessness of systems. We're also going to discuss whether Islam as a system is capable of serving humanity. Is it capable of bringing about change for the better? Is it capable of reviving Muslims from different uh, circumstances and serving humanity as a consequence? We're going to look at some of the problems uh, in the world today from which we need to bring about revival. We're going to look at whether revival is an individual process. Is it something that you can do on your own? Or is it a collective process and something that we need to do by joining together? I'm sure many of us already have an inkling as to what the answer is to that. But nevertheless, we're going to look at it um, uh, a bit more comprehensively. And finally, we're going to look at what we can actually do to bring about a good and responsible and a beneficial revival for all people. Now, to begin, let's look at humans. Let's look at human beings and what changes. Now, what are, the what are the types of things throughout human history which can change? Not things which necessarily must change, but what sort of things do change in society? Technology changes, the tools with which we use to, to achieve certain results. Those tools change. For example, communication changes. Uh, before we would write letters, today we have the internet. So these kinds of things are things which change, technology. Culture changes. Languages change, they develop over time, they borrow from other languages, they develop to accommodate and, and give words to new objects and new things in society. Traditions change, symbols change, and actions according to, to those cultures also change. Religions and ideologies also have the capacity for change. Again, we're not talking about whether things must change or should change, but the fact that things do have the ability to change. For example, different religions have evolved over time. Christianity has changed, Judaism has changed. Other religions have also developed and, and, and have abilities to change in society. Politics change. For example, leadership of uh, particular factions in politics, they change all the time. The power of different p uh, political parties changes all the time. These are things which change. The weather, the climate, the, 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 the environment, these are all things which change. But what things do not change? What things stay constant no matter what period of time, no matter what place you go to? What things are constant in society? The first, and perhaps the most important, is human nature. Human nature, regardless of all those other changes, does not change. We all have the nature to want to survive. This doesn't change no matter what time or period you go to. The human nature towards reproduction, towards social relationships, towards spiritual motivation, the need to sanctify something, to use our intellect, to use our five senses, these are things which have never changed regardless of technology or culture or politics or, or the environment. And similarly, human problems at their very heart fundamentally haven't changed. The ways in which they manifest might change, for example, the problems in the environment or, polit or politics or, or culture, cultural problems. But at the heart of it, the fundamental structure doesn't change. Humans have always lived in collectives. We have different forms of entertainment, we eat, we get rid of waste, we make tools, we use them, we communicate, we store knowledge. There are wars and fighting, there is peacemaking and friendship. We have children, we use medicine, we're looked after when we're sick, we create families and ultimately we leave this earth. These are things which do not change. These are things wherein we encounter human problems and these things are constant throughout times and different periods. It's like if you sent a child from today back a thousand years. Now, he may not recognize some of the ways that people um, uh, organize themselves. For example, you know, the clothing may be different or the mode of transport may be different. But ultimately, he'll still recognize the, the values and or not the values, but the ways in which people need to communicate, the ways in which they need to have friendships and the ways in which they need to survive. These things don't change. But when is change necessary? 
So now we've understood what things can change and what things never change. So the question we must ask is not what change, but why a change? When is change necessary? When does this question come about in society? It doesn't come about usually when things are very good and rosy. So what, what are the triggers which ask us to consider that we need to change or revive or reform or, or any of these questions? Now, if someone says that uh, a child in school is not getting, he's not getting good marks, it's a good school, everyone else is getting good marks, but this kid, he's just not doing so well. Then we say that the child needs to reform himself with the assistance of the parents, but it's essentially the child that needs to make the changes. Similarly, or not so similarly, but <laughs> another example, if a criminal commits a crime, if a criminal commits a crime in a society that, uh, that enforces justice and, and punishment for crime, if he commits a crime, then the, the person needs to be reformed so that he can become again a law-abiding citizen. So there is another circumstance in which change needs to take place. If a university course isn't well designed, if it's badly designed, it's just, you know, people don't really understand it, they don't really learn anything useful from it, then that course needs to be changed. But if someone wrote a perfect car manual for a particular type of car, a Mercedes E-Class 3 litre 2013, a precise car, has a precise manual, you would never need to change that manual because the reality is that manual specifically describes a specific type of car. So the question is, is Islam or was Islam a perfect description of the human being? And is, the, is, is, the, is Islam the perfect manual giving humans guidance for what needs to be changed or repaired? Or do humans need to change? Or does the manual need to be changed? So it's not like belief, for example, many Muslims, Belief is not like food, it doesn't have an expiration date. You don't throw it, you know, you don't throw belief away when, you know, when you think, you know, it's, it's gone off after some time. And sometimes people say, oh, Islam is far too old to apply in the modern world. And we're going to go into why this is not the case. Islam is far too old to apply in the modern world. But many of the ideologies which are in the modern world are far older. Islam is how many years old? About 1400. Democracy, for example, is 2,500 years old. So it's not a question of what's old or what's not, but rather the timelessness of systems and which systems respond to the unchanging human needs in society. So Islam is just a system. It's a system. Not just a system, but it, it is a system. And it directs a set of relationships between things. And it gives also a method for implementing these relationships. And it can be implemented in different ways, depending on the tools available. But the system itself doesn't change. For example, the verse in the Qur'an mentions that Muslims uh, must observe modesty. And it tells us that one of, the, one of the few methods, one of the methods, is to cover certain parts of the body. And it suggests a style to do this. So the method is to cover the body. And the style, it explains, it posits one possible style, which is to draw the khimar, which was traditionally the head covering of the time. The word for the head covering at the time was a khimar. And it suggests that the style is to also use this to cover the chest as well. So it's given a goal. The goal is to observe modesty. And then it's given a method, which is to cover certain parts of the body. And then the style it suggested is to use the khimar to cover the, the chest. So do you see the difference between method and style? The method is what needs to be, um, how, like the criteria which needs to be fulfilled, and the style is a possible way to fulfill that criteria. Now in the modern world, for example, we might use different styles of covering. For example, you know, we may uh, have um, uh, different types of fabrics or different techniques of stitching or draping or layering. So we have people wearing, you know, different styles of covering, such as the chadar, the, the tighter hijab, uh, a more, you know, a, a different type of amir hijab. There's many different styles of covering. However, the method is still the same. The method is to cover certain parts of the body. The method doesn't change, the styles change. So this is the difference between, again, this is leading on from the things which can change in society and the things which don't. And Islam prescribes a method which is intended not to change, it's intended to be timeless, 
the style can be changed and adapted. Now, the next question which comes about is whether Islam is actually capable of producing a culture that can either keep up materially with the current um, cultures in society and is it able to even offer something maybe even better? And the question as to whether it's capable of being of service to wider humanity as well, not just for Muslims in of themselves, but whether it's as a system, if we were to revive it, would it be something that would benefit everybody around us as well? Because sometimes, and especially the young, but not necessarily just the young, but we think that Islam will hold us back. We think that sometimes Islam will hold us back compared to the rest of society. That if we adhere to the method of Islam, that somehow we'll be left disadvantaged. So we're going to look at whether this is really the case. For example, and this is something which more and more young women um, are thinking about today, and also uh, young men as well. Many believe that a belief in religion will somehow impede the desire to study science, that those who are religious are not really interested in science and that you know, they don't have uh, the, uh, equipped, uh, the equipment, the mental equipment, as in because their religion doesn't guide them or it doesn't tell them to pursue science. It tells them only to pursue spirituality and these other things. Many people have this idea that you know, uh, religious communities are not scientifically advanced. Now, history aside, because history will give you a very different picture and that um, religious communities um, in the past have been pioneers of science. Um, but let's look at the question intellectually in of itself without any, any of those kinds of, of uh, evidences just yet. Now, as I mentioned or um, about to mention, religion and ideology and particularly Islam deals with the purpose of existence. For many Muslims or for all Muslims, the purpose of Islam is to tell us our purpose. It's to tell us the meaning of things and the value of things. And religious concerns are not only, however, in the non-material subjects. It deals with law, belief, value and meaning, for example, in language. And these things are not, not necessarily material. These are metaphysical things. These are non-material things. And this is one reason why many people think Islam is not so interested in the material world. And these subjects, these, uh, these non-material subjects, they inform human activity. And science, for, uh, for Muslims, is understood as being, and, and generally science in of itself, is it's simply a research tool. It's a research tool to discover what exists within the material world and how it works. Not why it works, but how it works. It's to understand the material world, to understand the cause and effect between different materials. It's nothing more than this. It's a research tool. And what are the prerequisites for scientific discovery? And let's see if Islam asks us to be conscious of this. Now, the prerequisites, if you think about it, really, the first is to have curiosity. It's to have curiosity about the material world. It's to have curiosity about the world itself. And the second is to have ideals or to want to solve problems. Because if you are not interested in this, it would just be a pastime, like just observing the flowers for the sake of it. Rather, scientific discovery requires curiosity and it requires ideals, it requires a goal. And the Qur'an asks us to be curious all the time. And it does this by asking us to observe the material world. So for example, in the Qur'an it says, Would not they go and see how camels are created, how the sky is raised high, how the mountains are fixed firm, how the earth is spread out? How, how, how? It's asking us to be curious about the material world. We're also told in the Qur'an, we're asked rather, do you see the water which you drink? Do you bring it down from the cloud or do we? Again, it's asking us to think about the source of things, the cause and effect of this. It's asking us to think and observe and be interested in the material world. And it goes on, verily in the heavens and earth are signs for those who believe. Another verse, now let man consider, let him think, how he came into an earthly existence. How did he even appear into this world? And the Quran explains, he is created from a gushing fluid proceeding from between the backbone and the ribs. Again, verily uh, therein are, are signs for men of understanding, men who think, men of intellect. It's asking us to be curious and to use our minds. And then it posits ideals. 
It posits those goals and objectives that we should also be achieving if we are to be thinking about revival, not just in a spiritual sense, but in holistic society, economics, technology, everything, medicine. Ideals, it says, for example, in the Quran, Allah has indeed made all things in heaven and earth subservient to humankind. It's all from him. And herein are portents, are signs for people who reflect. He's made all these things at our disposal. These are the ideals. It also goes on. A Muslim, this is from, from a hadith, uh, which means um, a saying or action or approval of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, the hadith or the narration says, a Muslim is never satisfied, he's never satiated in his quest for good until it ends in paradise. So again, it's positing an ideal that Muslims must strive for. And we're told in the Quran, so disperse in the land, go out into the land and seek of Allah's bounty. Make use of all this which he has created subservient to you. And seek by means of what Allah has given you um, uh, of the future abode and do not neglect your portion of this world. So it's asking us to be concerned not just with the hereafter, but with this world as well. And what's the reason? Why does it ask us to be considerate and to be conscious of what's going on in this world as well? And this is because Islam asks us to be responsible for solving problems in society. Just for example, it asks us to improve living conditions. So removing something harmful from the road is considered, is considered charity in Islam. This is a part of improving living conditions of society. With regards to the economy, we are given the following uh, goal, uh, problem-solving uh, task. Whoever fulfills, the need, whoever fulfills the needs of his brother, God will fulfill his needs. So we're being asked to consider economically and materially other needs of our brothers being fulfilled, other needs of, of other people in society being fulfilled. In terms of progress in medicine, we know about the hadith where a Bedouin asked, um, O oh, Messenger of Allah, should we not treat sickness? Like he was asking, should we, should we be concerned with medicine and this kind of thing or not? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, treat sickness, for God has not created any disease except he has also created the cure. In other words, we are asked to be concerned with the development of medicine, the development of science, the development of economy, the development of improving social conditions in society. This is the criteria for reviving for reviving societies. These are the criteria. We don't have to rely on somebody to tell us or on somebody to think up that these are good things for us to do. We've been told by the Creator that in all times and places, this is a responsibility. This is a responsibility on every one of us. And there's hundreds of examples of Muslim pioneers in science and technology, hundreds. Everybody should spend some time doing some research for motivational reasons, if nothing else, but also for, um, for the reasons of having an understanding of our historical knowledge and to know how much these verses and these kinds of ideals have already been fundamentally part of our history and part of the reasons for many of the successes of our past, um, of our past uh, times um, in the world. And what about women's successes? Given that this is you know, predominantly uh, a women's conference, let's talk about women's successes in some of these fields in the past. Now, spurred on by some of these guidances from the Creator, intellectually, at least 8,000 female scholars are documented to have been female, at least 8,000. For anybody who's interested, there is a, um, a study b uh, done by uh, Sheikh Akram Nadwi, and he's produced a book called uh, Muhaddithat. This is a... Uh, is that... Okay, let's see if that's better. And uh, this text, he looks into... Uh, he tries to find out and discover as many of the female scholars as possible. And he's found at least 8,000, and that's only those who are known of. There are many who prefer, for reasons of privacy, to have not had their names known in society. These are just those who are well known and documented. And some of the re most renowned male scholars have depended on and praised the scholarship of their female teachers. Many of the very, very prominent male scholars to whom we refer to and defer to today actually studied under female scholars. <coughs> and this was not considered something this is not considered something, uh, you know, uh, special that we had this many female scholars. It was considered something normal, something which was socialized as being normal. Yeah, we have female scholars, so what? 
And that's how we should be. It shouldn't be considered that, oh, you're doing that and you're a woman? Wow, as if we are somehow not able to do those things. Islam has given us the same intellect as anybody else. Men and women are considered to have the same intellect. It should not be considered something special that women do these things. We should make this normal. This should be normal in society. Similarly, economically, amongst the Islamic rights um, delivered to women, uh, is the, uh, many of us know, the Islamic right to inherit, to acquire control and dispose of property according to your own, according to your own preference and your own will. And you don't need the consent of, of, any, of any male members of society in order to do that under Islamic um, law. Uh, women also don't have um, the obligation to uh, provide for the family from that wealth. In other words, women had more freedom to do with that wealth and have more freedom to do with that wealth or should have um, than, than men have because men have the obligation of providing financially. And just as an example, in Islamic history, um, in more prosperous times, the Muslim women were legally entitled similarly to manage their own wealth and they very much did so. And in fact, they played such a fundamental role, for example, in the economy of the Ottomans, including being landholders, holders of military fiefs, borrowers, lenders, private tax collectors, they were partners in business. Various um, women from various backgrounds were commonly trading and dealing in the marketplaces. Again, this was not something unusual. This was like in Arabic, you say, Adi, like it's normal. It's just, yeah, whatever. And it's documented that, um, that uh, upper class uh, uh, women, for example, um, in Ottoman society, uh, who were more likely to be cloistered behind screens. So generally, the, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it was noted that sometimes the upper class women in those societies, uh, they were more likely to be kind of in uh, extra levels of segregation and extra levels of, of veiling. And often this is for like um, security reasons, like VIPs and things like that. You know, they often have more security and more, it's for, you know, safety and things like this. And it's documented that they didn't commonly directly deal with men. And they were perceived sometimes by outside observers as being forced, as being forced to, you know, not, not deal with men. But really, these women had male employees doing everything for them. They would give them the orders. They would say, this is what you need to do, X, Y, and Z. They would communicate it to them. And they had male employees and agents acting on their behalf. So again, women, uh, you know, were very active in economic um, uh, remit of society. And, you know, some of these women were, were very powerful business owners and they're documented to have owned many of the shops in the market in the first place. Many of the shops that the men were going out into work in, um, often these were, you know, female powerful business owners. You know, how unfortunate it must have been for these women to have, you know, all these people running around doing their work for them. Uh, there's, so sometimes, um, there's this idea that just because you have certain um, uh, uh, laws that you must abide by in terms of uh, observation of modesty and things, that this somehow limits your role in society, and it doesn't. And, uh, for example, women in this society were also heavily involved in craft, silk and cotton spinning. And, for example, in Mosul, um, cotton thread making was an industry that was, by and large, it was carried out on a part-time basis in the home by women. So, uh, the, you know, work and home life was not distant and separate as it is now. Now we have made um, work life something which is always outside. And, and distant from the home, requiring commuting, you know, a lot of time uh, lost in travel, needed the need for childcare, and it's basically separated, it's, it's pulled lives apart in many ways. And at one point, um, this industry, the industry of uh, cotton and thread making, was heavily dominated by women who would have these uh, facilities within their homes. They would have the facilities to actually do their work and produce uh, these goods in their homes. And the industry was so monopolized by women that actually the men were like, this is not fair. And they went to the state and they complained that, you know, these women have like a cartel going on here. Like it's a bit of a monopoly. Can you do something about it? And the state had to intervene. And this is how active, it's obviously not good to have a monopoly in society, but this is just to show that women were economically active and trying to pursue and better society in as many ways as possible. They also played, because of this disposable wealth I was talking about, they also played a fundamental role in the distribution of wealth. And during the 18th century, for example, um, Muslim women of all classes um, in the Muslim world established around 30% of all the charitable foundations and trusts um, that were around. So in, in other words...
Muslim women funded schools, hospitals, caravansaries, baths, fountains, soup kitchens, hostels, and even the mosques themselves were financed throughout the, throughout the Muslim world uh, by women from their own personal resources and for the benefit of the public. Again, it's not pursuing material gain for, the, for its own sake, but to better society. And politically, under these um, uh, societies, women had the same rights as men to directly petition the state. They could go to the state um, and they could debate politics. And men and women both had a right to, um, well, what we call now the vote, but back well, in Islam is rather pledging, pledging allegiance to, to the state. And women have an e had an equal and have an equal um, remit to do this. And the social segregation of women from men was most common in, as I mentioned, upper class families where um, women of lower classes, however, were generally more free to circulate because of their heavy involvement in, uh, in you know, tertiary economic activities. So, for example, the actual trading side of things. And in reality, some parts of Islamic history were actually known as um, the Sultanate of the Woman. Uh, when the mothers, for example, of the sultans and other royal women uh, became so increasingly powerful and influential from behind the veils and the screens of the harem that um, it was thought that, um, you know, uh, the, the men ruled whatever, but the state affairs and things, but the women ruled them. So it was like just being in a cloistered or, you know, um, what was known as a harem, which is not in, in of itself an Islamic concept, uh, but it doesn't. It, it demonstrates emphatically that just because women are behind screens or veils, this does not mean that their role in society is restricted. Just a few examples. For example, Zubaida bin Jafar al Mansur pioneered a most ambitious project of digging wells and building service stations all along the pilgrimage route from Baghdad to Mecca. A woman named Sutaita, who was a mathematician and an expert witness in courts. Fatima al Fihri, who many of you know of, founded um, one of the first. Um, uh, um, mosques in Fez, Morocco, which also became the first uh, university in the world. It wasn't the first mosque, sorry. It was a particular mosque and it became the first university in the world. And an engineer, um, Al Ijliya, who became or who made astrolabs in Halab in Syria. She made astrolabs. So sometimes people think that, you know, being a better Muslim is just for the sake of, uh, of Muslims. It's just for the sake of yourself. It's just for the sake of improving either your own conditions or the conditions of, of Muslim society. But this is not true. And ultimately, it's for the sake of Islam, which means it's the sake of God. And God has given us a responsibility, as should be apparent by some of the verses I mentioned, to take what Islam and what God has given us, either through um, physical um, resources in the world plus using the guidance that God has given us, and it's asked us to do good to everyone. Whatever society we go to, we are asked to always either let it be as good as it is or improve upon it. Whether a Muslim is living in the UK or Canada or in the Muslim world, we all have an obligation to improve the environments and the societies in which we are living. For example, um, Having the resources to assist those in need can be seen in uh, one of uh, another one of the um, uh, periods in Islamic history. Uh, again, um, I've done a lot of study into the Ottoman world, which is why a lot of my examples are from there. But you can find similar uh, samples of prosperity in in many of the um, different periods of Islam. But for example, um, some of you may have heard that um, there was a terrible, terrible, terrible famine in Ireland in around 1848 so it was in the um it was it was a very very hard thing so the irish people relied on potatoes for sustenance and they had um a, a period in which they experienced a terrible famine people had nothing to eat people were starving to death and some people were starting to leave and you know really really it was a really really horrible and it's a dark time um in in irish history and in irish memory and the Ottoman, um, the Ottoman Caliphate at the time, they had the resources to assist. And so they sent resources. They were able to assist in some way. They sent resources to assist this other country, this other nation. They're not Muslim, but it's not relevant because they're human and it sent their resources to assist them. And it's funny because other, other countries or other empires, um, for example, um, uh, England and the Queen, they sent a certain amount of resources. And the Ottomans had more, and they wanted to send because they wanted to send whatever they could, not based on what anybody else had sent. 
and somebody said to them, look, you know, the Queen of England isn't sending that much, so can you, like, reduce the amount not to make her look, you know, not to make them look as bad? And they're like, okay. And so in front they sent a certain amount, but through other means they sent the rest. And there's a bay in, in Ireland, um, I can't remember the name, but there's a football team named after that particular bay. And it's that port or bay through which the Ottomans delivered as much as they could, whatever they had to assist these other, um, other nations in need. And so it's not just for our own betterment. Revival is not just for our own betterment. It's to equip us so that we can be of benefit to all of humanity. And just as an example of someone who observed this, who was not a Muslim, uh, Adam Smith, for those of you who might study philosophy or economics, will know that he's the founding father of modern capitalism. And he observed the following. He explained the impact of uh, Islamic rule as follows. And he said, these are his words, the empire of the caliphs seemed to have been the first state um, under which the world enjoyed that degree of tranquility which the cultivation of sciences requires. In other words, he's saying it created such stability, the right amount of stability and harmony between society that science could flourish. And he goes on. It was under the protection of those generous and magnificent princes, he calls them princes, but obviously we have different ideas about royalty and monarchy. He's, he's referring to the, the Islamic rulers. So he says it was under the protection of those generous and magnificent princes that tranquility which their mild, just and religious government diffused over the vast empire revived the curiosity of mankind to inquire into the connecting principles of nature. So he's observing that the Islamic uh, way of life or the Islamic uh, system created the groundwork and the ingredients and the fertile ground for the revival in all these different fields. But what's going on today? Now we come to the question I mentioned earlier, we would ask, you know, when is change needed? What's going on today? Now, I'm going to look very briefly, like literally a minute, at the context of the, of the Muslim world. Because upon hearing all of this, some people ask, what's wrong with the Muslim world then? Why is this not happening there? Why is the Muslim world in such a state of decline and trouble and corruption and tyranny and all these horrible things? And what we see in the Muslim world is essentially the declined remnants. It's the remains of what was once a great, dynamic and powerful society, a powerful organization of people. And the worst thing that happened to the Muslims by far, the worst thing which has given rise to this, was success and stability. It was success. And this occurred in around the 16th century. And that might, that might sound like a funny claim to make, but it's something that we all have to be conscious of. Now, intellectual thought, essentially in the Muslim world, degraded due to the natural stagnancy which sets in when a society experiences a long period of prosperity and relative stability. This is a risk. So we talked about establishing uh, stability and a good environment. The risk is that you become lazy and stagnant and you think, well, things are good. Let's just leave it as it is. But Islam requires the human being to remain active and on its feet. And thus the, 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 the intellectual life of the Muslims has declined into scholasticism, simply the imitation of the past without the understanding as to what goes with it, a blind imitation and conservatism, trying to keep to something which was there, but without the tools and the intellectual foundation, they can't propel if you're still imitating styles of the past and you don't understand the methods or the goals, this is what leads to some of the problems that we have. Has anybody heard of a particular fish called a catfish? Yeah, there's a series which has popularized this and now many people know what a catfish is. But um, some species, and in fact all species, require to be kept on their toes in order to continue to survive and in order to continue to exist. You can't just sit back and say, okay, I've done it now. When you finish school, a certain grade, you don't say, okay, I'm done. You keep going and you keep building and you keep developing. Once you've learned all of that, you go into the world of work and you build your experiences. We never at any point say, I've done enough now, things are good, we've done enough, you know. Because we can keep going and we have to in order to maintain and to give life and keep dynamic the fruits that we have built already. And to, in the Muslim world, the understanding also of the Arabic language declined. It declined massively. Um, you know, the Muslim world is more than just the Arabic speaking world. The number of Muslims in Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, outside, everywhere, 
This means, this, this, um, this decline in the understanding of the Arabic language also means that we've been disabled the means to produce reasonable jurisprudence. So we're relying on translations and other, other, understandings, and other understandings of things. We've prevented our own access to the original sources and to understand jurisprudence at its heart. And what this has led to is the prohibition of further ijtihad or jurisprudence or thinking on particular issues. And again, it leaves only imitations of past rulings devoid of their specific context. Again, the methods stay the same, but we are still implementing old styles rather than new styles. We don't seek to change the methods or the goals, but we may sometimes need to update or answer new questions about the style as to how we satisfy the law of God um, without, you know, without using a style which doesn't work anymore. And added to this, there are also in the Muslim world um, the irreligious practices of... Um, of some groups of people which became enshrined into culture, i.e. cultural practices. And Islam has been falsely believed to justify these practices and cultures, regardless of how blatantly un-Islamic these things are. Islam says one thing, culture says something else, and yet you'll be having a, a group of people saying, no, this is how we do it, this is how we do it in our people. And it's just like, this is not what Islam says. And Islam was brought about not to, and some of these things, for example, some of these cultural practices um, that take place in other parts of the world, female genital mutilation, honor killing, strange cultural marriage ceremony, superstition, these kinds of things which are not from Islam. And Islam doesn't say that, you know, your culture should be, uh, uh, you know, disappeared. Islam asks us to celebrate culture, is celebrate those things which make us different and through which we recognize each other, our different languages, our different food types, our different clothing, our different ways of greeting each other, our different ways of, of um, showing hospitality. All Islam does is it asks us to take away those things which are harmful. You can keep the rest of your culture and celebrate it, but it tries to take out those harmful parts of society, such as, for example, um, forcing people into um, both men and women get forced into marriages, forcing them into these things or practicing, like I said, some of these strange superstitious things which cause harm to people in society. It asks us to celebrate the religion in a way that makes it more beautiful, in a way that um, uh, uh, makes it ornamental and, and more wonderful in society and that it's honored and ennobled through Islam. So after, you know, you know, hundreds of years or 500 years of slow civilizational decline, um, invasions and, and other things in the Muslim world, Muslims in the Muslim world are now characterized by fatalism, defeatism, lethargy, given up, lazy, a pragmatic ends justifies the means survival mentality, different people reverting to almost tribal mentality, jostling with each other, power games, just trying to survive. This is not the signs of, a, of, the, of the wonderful and civilizational society that Islam is supposed to produce. Muslim societies are no longer in the Muslim world governed by ideals, but by simple power concepts of reputation, influence, brute force and social leverage. Now, what about around us today? Not the Muslim world, let's come to, to our society today, uh, or not today, but over here. <laughs> now, you know the circumstances of, of New Zealand far better than me, who's literally been here for you know, a number of days. I'm a guest here. Um, but try to conjure up in your own mind right now um, some of the very universal human problems that can and do occur in society and which you have seen manifest here. And often these, society, these problems occur in all societies, but they are allowed to occur and they become worse. They're exacerbated due to a declined or a reduced level of thinking, thinking about some of these things which I mentioned. Now, these might be, for example, as I mentioned, some people imposing cultural ideas under the guise of Islam or only a few voices trying to highlight problems in society and those with power and resources not listening to them or even sometimes making life harder for them. So try to conjure up some of those because you know better than me what's happening or um, if there are such things, you know, what you need to be working on. And again, remember that all these things are human problems. They are human problems which happen everywhere. They just manifest differently in different places. We, so we need to look at the question of essentially who in our societies are being deprived of what they need. And we need to remember that we are going to try to pull them up along with ourselves whether this means men helping women, women helping men, the rich he uh, helping the poor, the strong helping the weak, those with means helping those in need. 
because it's not just a, a lopsided thing. We can't just you know, work on, on one um, part of society to the exclusion of another. And this brings us on to the next question. The next question is whether revival or you know, improving society, is this an individual job or is this collective work? Is this something that we're doing just by ourselves as a person or is this something we're doing together? Many of us understand that it's collective, but let's look at why, and Islam explains why. Now, individuals are born into families and societies. We don't create ourselves, we don't bring life to ourselves, we don't raise ourselves, we don't wean ourselves, we don't, you know, uh, we don't even name, we don't name ourselves. We, we bought into families and societies and we, we rely on them to, to raise us to a certain level. So the individual belongs to a particular species, and it's complete with specific instincts and needs. We all have this. We do not choose our first language. We don't, it's an interesting thing to think about. We don't even choose our first language. It's something that's given to us. Language, you know, we depend on other human beings to teach us how to communicate, how to speak. There are some um, experiments done, or not experiments, but observations of uh, children who were found um, in the wild, feral children. And uh, they realized that uh, because these children hadn't been around other human beings, they not only didn't know how to speak, but no matter after they had reached a certain age, maybe I think it's five or seven or something, or I don't quote me on that age, but there is a particular age and it's very young. And after that age, it's very, very difficult, near impossible to teach a child to speak or to communicate after that age because that's how heavily we rely on other human beings during those tender years um, to even learn these basic skills. And so this is to show that, you know, what, what is an individual? How individual are we really? We rely on other people, um, you know, incessantly. And we also, um, we acquire nurtured characteristics and habits that we acquire through parents, through siblings, through society, sometimes through genetic or random accident. But we are influenced by all of these things to some degree. We are not just isolated individuals that can decide how we develop or, or how we communicate or how we live. We can decide later, but not at that, at that initial stage. And individuals tend, by and large, as individuals, we tend to conform to the society around us. We tend to conform to the host society. And any reason uh, why we should regard the individual's own interests as more special than the environment that created it can't be proven by looking at an individual philosophically any more than it can be proven by looking at a cell in a body. How individual is a cell in the body? It's not really that individual. In of itself, it is an individual cell. But what does that mean? Not much when you consider that it is nothing without the rest of the body. And furthermore, Islam contains aspects that highlight our mutual dependence. For example, the Day of Judgment is not just one-to-one -one interviews with God. For example, some of us or some people say, it's between me and God, it's none of your business. But God, as we know, judges people and associates together. So we don't just have one-on-one -on -one interviews, but people, for example, shall bear their own loads. So we will be responsible for our own deeds, but also others who we influenced. So whether for good or for bad, if we incur, for example, bad deeds, which may Allah um, forgive us all for, we also incur those of who we influenced to do other bad deeds. And on the flip side, we're not only just to cheer everyone up, not only do we get the reward for good deeds, of our own, but also those that we encouraged others to do, or that we did unto, you know, we, we taught, and this is why education, for example, is considered a continuing um, source of good deeds, even after you have left this world, because you've passed on something which continues to generate um, good deeds for you. And so, um, the human purpose is directed to work for a higher goal than just the individual. It's not just about ourselves, it's about, you know, society and who we benefit around us as well. And we're instructed to join collectives, we're instructed to cooperate for this higher goal. And we have responsibility, many of us know, to our families, to our neighbours, neighbours, brothers and sisters in faith and brothers and sisters in humanity. And we have other responsibilities from this. And we are prohibited from spreading corruption and, and um, you know, bad things in society. And um, we are mandated to take action against those that do bad things in society. 
And the Quran says, for example, that um, in uh, uh, one of the verses, it describes that the, the, succe the successful ones are those who put others above themselves. So in um, uh, verse uh, 15, uh, chapter 59, verse 9, you'll find an explanation of some kinds of people who are the successful ones because they put others above the individual, they put others above themselves. And so we're seeing now that it's not just an individual process, but rather it's something greater. Now, Islam, as we can see, has individual aspects, for example, individual accountability, and it has collective aspects, such as collective accountability. And if you have one without the other, this is what leads to, to you know, corruption and tyranny in, in the world. But what about rights and duties? So when we talk about revival, it necessitates the guaranteeing of certain rights and duties in society, because without this, we can't enforce or we can't ask people to say, look, this is something that I should be getting, but I'm not. So how does this pan out? Now, Islam doesn't just talk about rights alone. It doesn't talk about rights in of themselves. This is very important to understand revival, because sometimes we just focus on our own rights and we don't get revival. We get some people excelling and ending up either very lonely or, you know, not, not excelling as a whole because we haven't, you know, collaborated with one another. So Islam doesn't talk about rights alone. And just to think about this, you know, intellectually for a moment, like Islam doesn't respect or God doesn't respect a natural right automatically, a natural right to life or pleasure seeking. We don't have a right to this. This is something that God has, has given us as a blessing and a mercy. This is not, we can't say, oh, I have to God, I have a right to live or I have a right to this or I have a right to that. The nature and the universe doesn't either. For example, say we have a, if we say we have a right to life automatically by virtue, no other um, source, just we say, oh, I have a right to life. It doesn't come from God telling us anything. If you were on a desert island and with wild animals and, you know, scarce resources, hardly any food, would you say, you know, to the island, I have a right to life? Would the island respect your right to life? No. So rights are not something which just exist in a person individually, but rather, as we see, duties bring about rights. I'll explain what I mean. Now, it's only through the pursuit of duty that rights come into being. I only have a right to something if somebody else has a duty to fulfill something towards me. If someone has the right to life, it's because others have been given a duty to protect their right to life and a duty not to harm them. And this is the nature of rights and duties in Islam. This is why we are known to be interconnected and reliant on each other. There's no such thing as I have a right regardless of anyone else. Rights are reciprocal and social uh, realities. And just as an example, or, or a small parable, and I've shared this before in, in New Zealand, so for those who have heard it, I hope you enjoy it the second time. And uh, this, is not from, uh, this is not from any Islamic text, rather this is a Chinese fable, this is a Chinese story, but it illustrates beautifully uh, the relationship between people in society in terms of balancing those rights and duties. So a man, you know, his life came to an end and he passed away. And uh, he went up to the sky, he went up to, um, to find a, an angel. And he asked the angel, um, uh, I would like to see what hell looks like. He wasn't sure where he was going. He just, he, he said, I want to know what hell looks like. And uh, the angel said, okay, I'll take you, I'll show you. So the angel takes him to a room. And in this room, like this room, there's long tables going up and down, um, chairs on either side, and the tables are covered with like feasts and food and a huge banquet is prepared, hot, steaming, sizzling, aromatic, every cuisine you can imagine, fresh, right off of the stove. The tables are covered. This is hell, by the way. And uh, there's people sitting all up and down on either side of the tables. And the man is confused. He's like, this is hell? Like, I don't understand. And the people who are all sitting there ready to eat, they all have really long chopsticks. And these chopsticks are so long that by the time they manoeuvre them to actually get a hold of the food at the end of the chopstick, plates here, let's say, and they've got these chopsticks and they really want to eat them. They really want to eat. They really want to satisfy their own hunger. And by the time they've got the food on the end of the chopstick and they hold it up, like they can't reach it round and get it into their mouth. The chopsticks are just too long. And so they're all suffering. They're all like, this food is right here and we can't enjoy it. And this is how the angel depicts hell to be. And the man is like, okay, what, is he what does heaven look like? He's, at this point, he's somewhat 
confused as to what this, you know, you can sense what's going on. But then the angel takes him to, to heaven. And again, it's a similar room, tables lined up and down, covered in beautiful banquets, beautiful foods, again, fresh, sizzling, uh, you know, just as good as the last place. And again, people sitting up and down along the tables, either side. And again, they've got really, really long chopsticks. But instead of trying to feed themselves and struggling and not being able to get the food in their mouth because chopsticks are too long, they're actually using the chopsticks to reach over the table and feed each other. And so they're all enjoying the food. They all have the need. They all want to enjoy the food. And they all are, not just by trying to satisfy their own needs, but by actually seeing what the limitation is, the chopsticks, and figuring out a way to make sure everybody gets what they need, and which is simply through cooperation. And this is the balance of right and duty that we also find in Islam. Any time that someone is given a right or an advantage or a privilege, any time that someone is given a weakness or a, a restriction or something which inhibits them slightly, it's given them an equal responsibility towards each other so that neither experiences that and it, it requires them to work together so that we can appreciate and realize what God has created in humanity. He's not created just sole individuals, but he's created people to work together to realize what his mercy really is. And the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he explained, and this time obviously the parable is from Islamic sources, um, he explained that the example of the person or the group of people that follow law's guidance in this respect, and the example of those that don't follow it can be understood in the following analogy, and he explained the following. Obviously, my words right now are not word for word because I'd like to explain it to you in, in, in a simple way, hopefully. And he explained that it's like human beings in society pick lots. You draw straws as to what you're going to get in life. And he explains that it's like drawing lots to get onto a boat. And, you know, some people get the long straw, some people get the short straw. And he explains that some people get the long straw, which means they can be on the upper deck. And some people get the short straw, which means they are inside in the lower deck. And this can be in terms of st physical strength, physical weakness, intellectual capability, and those who are not as interested or as, you know, intellectual. Those who are, you know, of better, have more wealth than others. Any time in society someone is given an advantage over the other, this example is explaining those with advantage are in the, top, in the upper deck and those with the lesser advantage or the weakness are in the lower deck. And it says that the explanation goes on that when those in the lower deck need water, they have to go up and ask the people in the upper deck to give them drinking water because in the lower deck they can't access it, they are in the, in the bottom of the boat and those in the upper deck have access to the water. And it's like when they went up and that troubled those in the upper deck. The people in the upper deck said, oh, for God's sake, you know, like those with the wealth or the strength or the advantage, you know, they got, they got irritated and they didn't want to satisfy the needs of those in the lower deck. And so those in the lower deck didn't want to trouble those in the upper deck. And so they said, okay, let's make a hole in the bottom of the boat to get water so that those people in the upper deck, if they don't want to help us, you know, let's not bother them, we'll do it ourselves. And we all know what will happen if people start making holes in the lower deck of society out of desperation, everyone goes down. And so when we are given rights and duties in Islam, it's not only um, uh, you know, the right of the person on the upper deck or the duty of the person on the upper deck to fulfill those, but if in the lower deck any person in society does not have their rights being fulfilled, you have a duty to ask the people in the upper deck and demand that they fulfill it because if they don't, everyone's going to go down. Drilling a hole in the bottom is not a solution. And so again, this is how Islam talks about the need for, in terms of revival, it has to be a collective process. If someone is lagging, you have to pull them along with you. You have to put pressure on them. If people in society are not being helpful, unless everyone, you know, we're only as fast as the slowest person on our team, as the saying goes, for those who go maybe, and when we go trekking or, or something like that, we know that the team is only as fast as the slowest person in the team because we leave no person behind. And this is the Islamic explanation or the Islamic guidance as to how we should be working together to bring about revival in society. And if only one portion of society progresses and develops, if we focus only on, for example, the men, or if we focus only, for example, on the women, we end up in a lopsided situation. 
where, as I said, you know, the, we end up with these disadvantages that will eventually bring us all down. It's like a bodybuilder that only works out one arm. Like, you wouldn't be able to do very good press-ups then if he's only had one arm, unless he's doing one-armed ones. But generally, you know, you don't have bodybuilders just working on one side of their body. You don't have buildings where they say, okay, we're only going to build half of the building's foundations, the rest of it we're just going to leave to chance. We don't do that. We need, like, a strong foundation all round. Or a car where the wheels on one side are flat. When we look after our car, we look after all of the parts of it because we know that, you know, it all has to be functioning and it all has to be up to scratch in order, you know, um, to get anywhere. And if we don't, we're not going to do very well, even in the short run. Forget the long run, but even in the short run, we will end up with certain problems. And so that section was about individualistic and whether revival is individualistic or whether it's collective. And I hope we can see now that reviving ourselves it will fall short if we just focus on ourselves because it's a collective it's a collective responsibility. Now, what can we do for revival? What are the things that we should actually be doing to bring about revival, to bring about some of these things that we've discussed, some of these prosperities, some of these ways in which we can assist other people? Now, the role of men and women is largely the same in Islam because Islam recognises that men and women are largely the same and it gives different roles and different rights and duties in those small ways in which we are different. So it recognises a distinction. By and large, we are given the same rights and duties and the same instructions and the same guidance. Only in those small areas where we are different, it gives us slightly different um, duties. But it's important to note, for example, that a ruler discharging his duty, a ruler doing a good job and making sure that he's done everything according to the book, the book, i.e., you know, of Islam, he's doing everything as he should be, is inherently not greater than a mother that discharges her duty according to the book. There is nothing to say that one is superior to the other. Everybody is given a different duty in Islam and discharging that duty gives us all an equal chance to seek Allah's pleasure and to seek um, uh, virtue and piety. It doesn't matter what role you're doing, if you are doing it well, that's, that's, what, um, that's the duty that we have been given. And thus, for example, we have the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, who explained that a ruler is like a shepherd over his people and he will be asked about his flock. The man is like the shepherd over his family and he will be asked about his flock. The mother is the shepherd of, a, of, the, of the husband's property and his children. She will be asked about his flock. Whatever responsibility we have been given in society, we are all equally accountable, whether it's ruling the state or whether it's um, raising children. It's all a, a, a responsibility that ha none is greater than the other. And this is why women's, in women's life work, um, we are given so many paths to seek um, to seek this prosperity and to seek God's pleasure. Paths in homemaking, raising children, some of the other things I mentioned, such as technology, politics, economics, it's all valid life work. These are all things which we can be pursuing and um, uh, in which we can be, as long as it's for the purpose of discharging the duties that God has given, these are all um, uh, you know, valid ways of, of living. And the way forward for Muslims all over is to campaign and to educate yourselves, to educate all of ourselves, to develop critical thinking and to work in organisations, both existing ones, whether they have some problems, and if there are people on the upper deck in those organisations, to put pressure on them to make sure those in the lower deck are, are, are happy and have their rights uh, fulfilled, and also to form new ones to fill gaps in society. And this is so that Muslims can rediscover the intellectual basis behind their belief and not just follow Islam blindly or imitate things of the, par uh, of the past, and also not solely to rely on emotional faith. And this is a very important point. Now, in Islam, the spirituality aspect and the emotional aspect is so important. However, if we rely only on that, and we don't have an intellectual foundation or an intellectual understanding as to why certain things are important, as to why it's important for me to be respectful and kind and fulfil the needs of another person. If I wake up one day and I'm like, do you know what, I'm not feeling, not feeling spiritually up to scratch today. I'm not feeling it. So, do you know what, forget, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to fulfil people's rights, I'm not going to do this stuff. Because if you rely only on emotion and only on spirituality, you know, when your iman is low, you're going to relinquish and you're going you're gonna to fall behind on those things. And this is why, for example, in Islam it says that the iman 
the Iman, like Islam recognizes that we go through cycles with spirituality. It says that it's like clothes. Sometimes they get worn out and you need to renew them. And in those periods when we are emotionally or spiritually declined, we can't leave it to chance. We can't leave other people's rights and, and things to chance. This is why we have to have the intellectual understanding as well. And this is something that we should focus on when we think about revival. And so what we also should be doing is centering our lives, our societies and our communities based around achieving, achieving our purpose. And we should place this purpose, i.e. to serve Allah and through serving society, this should be our ideal. And this is what should organize our world's view. This is what should give us direction. This is what should motivate us and bring some people out of lethargy, out of laziness, out of you know, the defeatist mentality that I can't do anything. It should be this motivation which turns society into a, vib a vibrant and dynamic and creative society, something that is, is fulfilling all of this. We have to recognize and we have to understand those uh, non-Islamic traditions and, and cultures and, and things like that that have thus far promoted confusion, dysfunction and civil strife in society, some of the things I mentioned earlier. We need to recognize them so that we understand and we are equipped in discerning them and telling the difference between problem and solution and so that we can responsibly offer an alternative. We can offer what Islam says. This is how Islam posits that we should deal with this issue. This is a reason why we must, for example, um, the organization I'm with is the Muslim Debate Initiative. And what we do is we openly discuss different ways of belief, different ideologies and different systems in an intellectual way, in a respectful way, and always bringing evidences and, and facts and substantiating the claims. Not simply saying, because Islam says, we have to establish um, a groundwork so that people understand why Islam says what it does, why other cultures or beliefs say what they do, and so that people can evaluate the evidences for themselves and see which solution is right and which solution is wrong. It's not to impose something on anybody, but so that everybody can make an informed decision. And the Muslim Debate Initiative, many of our events are, are geared towards building this dialogue in society and building this critical thinking. And in this way, we should accelerate the revival of the intellectual life amongst all of us. We shouldn't have just a few people who are specializing and becoming so knowledgeable that we just defer to them, but rather even the lay person should develop a basic understanding of jurisprudence. This was very normal throughout Islamic history that people would have basic understanding, the type of which today we think is special and magnificent, when in reality, they, again, this was something very normal. Everybody had a certain level of understanding. And so building this knowledge will um, lead to an improvement in, for example, the quality of scholars that are recruited, the quality of imams that are recruited uh, from, the, from the ummah. It will facilitate the creativity and essentially the flowering of a Muslim intellectual life. And we have to supplement the, um, the uh, personal um, life, uh, the spiritual personal life with a commitment to um, actual practice. It's all good knowing it up here and feeling it in here, but it has to be actually put into practice. And I've seen, for example, the community in New Zealand is very active in putting things into practice and may it also you know, always increase and improve. And we have to unite. Whilst respecting the plurality of thought within, within, uh, within Islam, we should maintain the right of others of difference of opinion within Islam. And this is something which is considered a mercy, to have difference of opinions, to have checks and balances within the, the framework of Islam. And we have to overlook this because some people say, oh, there's many different uh, schools and different thoughts and different sects. But the majority of Muslims agree on more than 95% of what Islam really is. We may disagree on things like where to place our hands in prayer and, you know, little things like this. But these are not things which should inform how we deal with each other. And Islam, by and large, by and large, it agrees on those things. And we see that many um, non-Muslim ideologies or non-Muslim countries, they have far more difference of opinion with regards to politics, philosophy, social theories, etc. than the Muslim scholars do, far more. But yet we don't see them engaging in the type of unnecessary squabbling that we have amongst Muslims. Why is this? We are supposed to value difference of opinion and, and um, uh, you know, unite on what is, uh, is common amongst us. And just to come back to the point of reach closing and um, uh, reaching the end now, um, it's both men and women. It's not just women and it's not just men. 
but together we have to develop um, in all these ways economically, scientifically and technologically. And so as we can see, we talked about what needs to be changed, what can change and what should change. And we can see that it's not Islam that needs to be changed. Islam is a timeless system. Human problems, as God has created them, have been the same throughout time. And we find that the solutions and the methods in Islam, of which we haven't done an in-detail examination of any particular thing, because this is about revival overall, but these are timeless solutions for timeless problems. And it's not Islam that needs to be reformed, it's not Islam that needs to be changed, but rather it's Muslims, like the child in the school that's not doing so well, we need to be reformed and we need to change and we need to revive and we need to empower Islam. It's not just about empowering ourselves. We need to empower Islam and its values of justice and righteousness and kindness. And it's by returning and adhering to Islam that will lead to revival, not just of the Muslims, but for the benefit of all people around. Jazakallah khair for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask at this time? Hi. Walikum salam. So the question essentially is, um, some people posit that because Muslims are the ones who practice Islam, that Islam is essentially what it, what, what, how it is practiced. So saying that the way in which we see Islam being practiced, essentially that is Islam, because it requires human beings to put it into effect. But the thing is, is that Islam is not just about what's being practiced. For example, if someone was to say, uh, I'm a Muslim and I believe in three gods, we can look at the Qur'an and say that's not Islam because Islam very clearly posits certain undeniable facets and features which dictate or which tell us what Islam is. And there are many things which people do in the name of Islam and yet we know we can turn to the text. The benefit that we have is revelation and revelation is not a simple process of, for example, you know, uh, a horoscope. It's not something that's so vague and ambiguous that it could mean anything. And an example is, for example, you know, reading tea leaves in a cup. Islam is not a cup of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, finished tea with leaves in the bottom and you say, well, I think that we should, this looks like a dog and a cloud. And no, the Quran has words, very clear words. The Quran describes itself as mubin. It describes itself as clear. It gives, it gives such precise laws and edicts. For example, inheritance, female, two thirds of the male. It's not even saying, you know, general ideas of what is right and what is wrong. It has very clear laws and very clear prescriptions about how we should live. And so if all, of, if all of Muslims started to do something which was completely un-Islamic, like worship three gods, we know that's not Islam. All you need is one person to look at the Quran and say, this is not Islam. And so sometimes I think people um, who wish to see Islam reformed, they come from uh, a different ideology where they are not looking at uh, Islam as the guidance for how people should live but rather they're bringing preconceived ideas or ideas from other ideologies about how Islam should be. And they are trying to read those into Islam. And one way to do this, this is why they make the argument that Islam is open to interpretation. They say Islam is open to interpretation and therefore it's open to this interpretation and they bring this other ideology. But you see that backfires, and I discussed this also at Auckland, that backfires because if you want to say that Islam is so open to, to interpretation, then what makes Irshad Manji's interpretation valid? What makes anybody's interpretation valid? If it's open to anything, then it becomes utterly meaningless. But the whole purpose of revelation, you know, is to give us a specific meaning. Otherwise, why bother? 
God could have just said, look, everyone has a certain fitrah which recognizes good and recognizes evil. Let's just rely on that. No, he gave us very particular guidance as to the method and to how it should be achieved. And in the most undeniable voice ever, the word of God. And so sometimes I think when people come up with um, the idea that um, Islam needs to be reformed, they need to create avenues in order to open this discussion. And one of those avenues is that Islam is open, so open to interpretation and that it's what people do and that's what makes it what it is. But all we need to do is look at the text. Luckily, we have a canon, we have a book, we have a text to refer to, to be able to tell, hmm, you know, um, worshipping three gods kind of doesn't really fit the bill. Just, that's just one example, but there are many examples of things which are done in the name of Islam. For example, violent acts, horrible, violent things which are not um, sanctioned in Islam. All we need to, good to do is go to the text and say, well, you know, no guys, sorry, doesn't, do, doesn't fly. So we have the benefit of a text, we have the benefit of a revelation, and we can tell the difference between what Islam is and what Muslims are doing. And if we couldn't, it would be a very terrifying state of affairs today because people, as they are, will be doing all kinds of things and there will be nothing to say that that wasn't Islamic. But we have something to say that's not Islamic and that's what we have to hold to. I hope that answers your question. Jazakallah khair. Okay, so the question is, um, what can women contribute perhaps in a scholarly, in the yeah. scholarly aspect? Yeah. Yeah. Now, some people have commented, uh, uh, what can women contribute in a scholarly aspect given the state of affairs in the world today, for anybody that didn't catch the question. Now, sometimes people say we have a decline in female scholarship and if we had more female scholars, we would have less of the problems that we have um, today. And so let's make more female scholars. Now, it's good to have female scholars. As I mentioned, it's not you know, something that we've not had in the past. We've had it in abundance. The reality today is that we've not just got a decline in female scholarship. We've got a decline in scholarship across the board. We, ha we have a decline in male scholarship and female scholarship. And simply um, saying we need more female scholars isn't necessarily in of itself going to fix the problem. We have to have a collective um, increase in the study and intellectual understanding at a scholarly level of Islam. And this is why I was talking about some of the things in the presentation about the need to involve everybody in society in that process. And sometimes people might say, oh, you know, women scholars might be better than male scholars. But Islam doesn't see any difference between male and female scholars because, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't see any difference in the intellect between men and women. Rather, it only looks at the quality of scholarship. We are only supposed to value the quality of scholarship, whether it's by men or whether it's by women. And so in terms of bringing about revival and what women can do, women can themselves also involve themselves in becoming scholars again like we were but not just focusing on women for its own sake, but also our sons, our nephews, and the men in society, we should be taking them with us as well. Because in many assets or, or many aspects of society, women now have more opportunity to, to develop than men do. For example, even, in, um, even in, in the UK at universities, there is now a gender gap in universities where not only more women are going to university, but more women are doing much better in university than men are, and men are almost being sidelined. That's just one example, but there's many like that. And so in terms of developing Islamic scholarship and improving and working towards intellectual revival, this is something we have to do again, not just as a, a woman ourselves, it is important, but we should be focusing on the quality rather than the gender of the scholar. And so this is something we should be um, inculcating and socializing from a young age and something that we should be looking at as, you know, important. It's very good to have, you know, sons and daughters as doctors and dentists and, and, and all these things. But sometimes if like a, a son or daughter says, oh, I want to be an alima or a scholar or, or I want to follow this path, sometimes the parents are like, well, no, I want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or something real. You know, they think it's something more, more practical or more beneficial. We need all of these things in society, not just one, not just the other, but we need to develop um, as you know, a collective because one person can't do everything. 
But as a society, we can tick all the boxes. We can satisfy all the aspects needed. You know, we can have people focusing on, um, you know, the sciences, people focusing on the religious sciences, people focusing on maths, people focusing on literature, people focusing on language. Together, we are supposed to do this. And so it's not just a matter of getting more female scholars, but rather the collective improvement of scholarship, not just in Islamic sciences, but in all sciences. Barakallahu <laughs> fiki, sorry. If anybody has any questions later, I'm around to, to chat further. So make the most of me being here and I'm making the most of your company and your questions. And I really appreciated uh, your attention. Jazakallah khair. <laughs>